Yeah. 
samayojitat Purayeva samayojitat Artam atmaniyamai Yadatam atmaniyamai Tvayai vaham samarchita Tvayai vaham samarchita Shri Bhagavan vacha Shri Bhagavan vacha Tvata vachaitam me Tvata vachaitam me Purayeva samayojita Purayeva
Om Akyana Timarandasya Akyana Chana Shalakaya Chaksura Milita Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadam Ayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Gurav Shri Yatapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Shya Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganatan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakha Nitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Dr. Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishapanus Dute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpa Darupyasya Kripa Sindhu Payevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Kyabha Shri Vasami Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We're hearing about the austerities of Kardama Muni. Kardama Muni is a great sage with mystic powers and he was ordered by Lord Brahma to do austerity. He was ordered by Lord Brahma to <coughs> help Lord Brahma in prop, uh, populating the universe at the beginning of the creation. This is Satya Yuga. There were, Lord Brahma was concerned to have population not on the planet, good population. And he asked, just like you know, he'd asked the four Kumaras to help him to populate the universe. But the four Kumaras were not inclined. So Lord Brahma similarly also instructed Kardama Muni that he should help to produce a good population for the planet. So Kardama Muni in pursuit of the order of Lord Brahma, he first of all went to do some austerities. You know, what we often see young people get married without doing any austerity. It's not a very good way. You can see, we see from Srimad Bhagavatam, there is many examples of the, the young men that were told, get married, but before the marriage, they first of all do some austerity to purify their consciousness. It is described here in this text, what is actually the qualification for a good husband? What, what qualities should the man have to make a good husband? It's this, he should be a good brahmachari. A good brahmachari, why he needs to get married? Just like Kardama Muni. He done austerity, did tapasya for 10,000 years. But he has a desire. What was his desire? He wants a wife. Was it wrong? No. It was, his, it was the order of Brahma. He was ordered by Lord Brahma that he should help to populate the universe. He should produce some progeny. And so in, in obedience to that order, he first of all did his austerity. And then the Lord appears to him and the Lord knows what's in his mind, what is his desire. And the Lord, he's saying, I've already arranged the, the arrangement of the Lord was there for the, the right woman to come to act as the wife of Kardamamani. 
So this will be described in later verses. But we have to understand uh, the duty of Kardama Muni, that he had been given the instruction. And that with that instruction, he, did, he went to fulfill that instruction. It was not whimsical, it was not just some uh, independent action on his part, but he was obedient to the, to the higher authority, in this case Lord Brahma. And he went to do his austerities, and of course when he was performing his austerities, he must have had in his mind what was the purpose, and what was to happen after the austerities. So purification of existence is required for people to produce good quality children. This is another point which is seen in this verse. That the young men, they do some austerity, purify their existence. Just like uh, one country I'm preaching in is Thailand. <coughs> Thailand is a Buddhist country. 95% maybe of the people are Buddhists. And it's quite common among people there that before marriage, the young man will, be, will go and become a monk for some time. He will go and become a monk, he will live in the temple, he will shave his head, put on the robes of a monk, and he will go out with the monks for begging every day. And they will do that for maybe a month, some do it for longer, you know, they take a vow to come be a monk for one month, and they're proper monk, and after the month is over, Oh, then they go home, then they have their marriage, <laughs> they're ready. You know, they've done, they've done a little bit of purification. So we see this idea here also in the Vedic literature. You can see it coming in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The Prachetas were another example. They also went to do austerity before their marriage. Then the sons of Daksha. The sons of Daksha, Daksha had first of all, was, was it? A hundred thousand or ten thousand sons. Anyway, he had two groups of sons, big numbers of sons. And before the marriage, told them go and do a, don't go and do some austerity and get purified. <coughs> so the sons all went to do austerity, but Narada Muni happened to see them, and Narada Muni thought, such nice young men, why do they need to get married? So Narada Muni preached to them, and they never went home. So then Daksha had more sons, and then again the same thing happened. So second, then after that, then Daksha produced daughters. We thought it would be easier. He said, my sons are all attracted to Narada Muni, they go away with him. He said, I'll have daughters instead. They will be more obedient. So like that, anyway, the example was there that they were going to do austerity with the idea they would get married and produce children. So we understand how uh, proper consciousness is required for householder life. It is not a life of sense gratification, but it's an ashram. Kardama Muni is going to become a householder. The Lord is arranging for a suitable woman to come for him. So uh, probably the, the purport in this case is dealing with the fact that the Lord understands the desire of every individual. We know our own desires. We don't know others' desires. Right? Krishna is in everyone's heart. He knows about everyone's pain and pleasure. We only know our own pain and pleasure. We cannot understand the thinking or the mind of some other person. We may speculate on it, we may guess, but we don't really know. But Krishna actually knows what is everyone's desire. He is in everyone's heart and he knows exactly what we're thinking. One reason is because he's there as the super soul. The super soul is seated next to the individual soul, the Jiva Atma. <coughs> the example is given two birds in the tree. Right? Just like two souls in the body, the two birds in the tree. One bird is eating the fruit and the other bird is a witness. The Jivatma, the, we, the individual soul, 
are eating the fruit, trying to enjoy the material world. Sometimes the fruit is sweet and sometimes it is bitter. Sometimes we meet with happiness and sometimes we get to stress. The Paramatma, the Super Soul, is the other birth and he is the witness to our activities. He knows everything. He knows the desires because he's seated right next to us. Just like if you spend your day living with somebody and they're with you all the time, then they know what is your desire. They can, they're, they're, because they're very close, so they, they can understand quite well what is, it, what is our desire, what we're thinking, what is our state of mind. So the same way the super soul is right next to the Jivatma and knows everything, what is our desires. And as a witness, Krishna will arrange for that, the desire to be fulfilled. But Prabhupada points out that the super soul will never arrange for something which will be detrimental for our Krishna consciousness. We may have some desires in our mind which are not actually for our advancement in Krishna consciousness. So the super soul is there that he understands what is actually good for us. He will never give something which is going to harm us. Uh, in this particular case, Kardama Muni, although a great sage and yogi with mystic powers and had completed 10,000 years of austerity, the Lord is arranging for a wife to come. Is this uh, against devotional service? No, it's the plan of the Lord. That the Lord wants Kardama Muni to have a wife and to produce children. And ultimately we will see that one child will be an incarnation of the personality of Godhead. Kapila Muni will appear, will appear as the son of Kardama Muni and Devahuti. So this is a uh, plan of the Lord, that he, he knows everything, past, present, and future. The Lord is omniscient. He knows everything, all phases of time. We don't know. We have to surrender to the plan of the Lord. What is his plan for us? <coughs> Just like when Srila Prabhupada was a, a child, it was predicted that he would cross the sea and that he would build many temples. So, that was the prediction when he was a, a child. Ultimately, the, the plan was fulfilled. But it was not clear how it would all be fulfilled. So in a similar manner, Kadama Muni is a great yogi and the Lord has appeared to him, indicating that he is a very special yogi. The Lord does not appear to just anyone and everyone. The qualification for the Lord to come uh, is, is, is very, very rare that the Lord will actually come. He, he may give instruction like in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Tesham Satita Yuktanam Bhajatam Pratipurvikam Tadami Buddhi Yogam Tam Yenamam Upayantite. To those who are constantly devoted to me and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. So the qualification to come to the Lord is that we have to be constantly devoted to Him and worship Him with love. So Kardama Muni must have had this kind of qualification because the personality of Godhead has actually come there in the forest, in the jungle, where he is doing his tapasya to his ashram. And he is instructing. He first he has heard the prayers offered by Kardama Muni and now he's replying. And he's telling Kardama Muni, I know what you want. I Kardama Muni didn't immediately say it, but Krishna is in the heart and he knows what is the desire. 
as stated in Bhagavad Gita, Sarvasya Chaham Riddhisani Visto Matakshmi Tir Gyanam Apohanam Cha Vidaishya Sarveraham Eva Vidya Vidanta Krit Veda Vidya Cha Lord Krishna is saying, I am in the hearts of all living entities. From me comes knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So Krishna, as the super soul in the heart of all of us, can perform three different functions. He can give knowledge, or he can give remembrance, or forgetfulness. And he arranges according to our desires. Sometimes we don't even know what is our own desire. But Krishna knows. Krishna can understand what is actually our desire. Because he's there in the heart. So sometimes he gives knowledge. For example, he can guide us. He can instruct us. We just quoted that verse from the Bhagavad Gita. If we're constantly devoted to Krishna and worshipping him, he will help us to come to him. He will give us knowledge from the heart. He will tell us what we need to do. He will say, we need to chant more. He will tell us from the heart. He will inspire us that we have to study more Prabhupada's books. We have to chant our rounds more carefully. We have to wake up early in the morning. Or maybe he will tell us from the heart that we're wasting too much time watching television. Right? These kind of things. This is Krishna giving knowledge from the heart. He's saying, you know, you don't really need these Tamil movies all the time. You know, <laughs> you know you'll live without them. So like that, this is the super soul in the heart. I know, because in Malaysia we have a lot of Tamil people. And we, the best time to go for book distribution, we go for book di We know that every Saturday afternoon there's a Tamil movie. So for sure, everyone's at home. <laughs> so that's the best time to go, to distribute books. Yeah. So Krishna gives that knowledge from the heart. He's guiding us, helping us. But he can also allow us to forget. Because he knows how much we want to enjoy this material world. So he allows us to forget what is actually our position. He allows us to forget that we are spirit souls. And to forget that we are meant to surrender to Krishna. He allows us to think, I am the body, and I can joy, I can be happy in this world. He allows us to do these things. This forgetfulness is there, so that we can try to enjoy more. Just like in a drama, if you, when you act in the drama, it's, it's important that we forget who we are. If we're still thinking in terms of our actual identity, we won't be able to act the part. To actually play the part of the drama, we have to, you have to really enter into the mood, into the, the consciousness of being that person. Just like, you know, in the, on the stage, you may be uh, playing the part, p playing a, a, a drama with your friend, and in the drama, your friend is your enemy, and you hate him. But in real life, your friend, so if you come into the drama and you're still thinking he's a friend, you won't be able to be good enemies. The whole mood of the drama will be ruined. So very important that uh, to play the drama that we forget who we are and we actually enter into the mood, the whole spirit of the drama. Prabhupada tells when he was a child, he was, as a young man, they were doing Lord Chaitanya's Leela. And they, they performed the different pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. And it was so moving. People were appreciating it so much that people were crying. They were actually shedding tears watching it. Because the, all the boys had been so well trained. They had become so conscious of playing these roles. So Krishna also allows us to play our drama. Just like here in this material world. You know, we're playing 
our, our part. Actually, by nature, we're all parts and parcels of Lord Krishna, his servants, and we have a, 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 we have a particular rasa with him in this spiritual world. Either we're his servant or his friend, or we have a parental rasa or conjugal rasa with, with the Lord. But here we are in this world and we're forgetting, we're thinking, I'm the father, I'm a, I have my wife, I have my children, I have my job, I'm an engineer, I am, you know, we're thinking like this, we're identifying, we're playing this drama here in the material world. So Krishna does a very good job of allowing us to forget what is our actual position. The purpose is so that we can just try to enjoy this material world more. Because Krishna knows, ultimately, we're not going to be happy. We're going to be disappointed. That we're trying to enjoy the material life. We're trying to enjoy the drum, this part which we're playing. But it's bringing us so much disappointment. We're always meeting with failure. Although we're trying very hard, but still we fail. We fail to actually find that pleasure we're looking for. And that, that is also Krishna's plan. Krishna plans it all like that. He is the supreme controller. And he's putting us into these different situations just so that we can suffer. Why? Because that suffering will bring us to take shelter at His lotus feet. Is it necessary that we have to suffer to take shelter at His lotus feet? No, it's not necessary. If we hear properly, if we actually hear Krishna's from the heart, Krishna telling us that you have to take up, you have to take up Krishna consciousness, you have to become serious, you have to follow strictly, you have to be a good devotee. If we hear Krishna's teachings and if we follow them, then we don't need to suffer. The suffering is there just to teach us a lesson. Just like sometimes the, the teacher may punish the student to teach them a lesson, to behave properly. So in the same way, Krishna is the, the best teacher. And he's arranged this material world for all of us to become purified. To realize that we cannot actually be happy without him. Turning away from Krishna is just putting us into ignorance and going to be the cause of so much suffering. We have to turn towards God. We have to recognize that there is God and we have a relationship with him. And all of our other purposes in life don't have to be given up, but they have to be connected to our service to the Lord. Krishna doesn't say everyone should give up family life, and nobody should have a family, nobody should have children. No, Krishna said everyone should simply surrender to me. But that does not mean that we have to give up duties or responsibilities. Rather, all of these duties and responsibilities have to be seen in relation to Krishna. That family life is also meant for Krishna consciousness. Most of the world are grihastas, married people, and they need to see the example of ideal family life. That is described in Srimad Bhagavatam. There's one chapter titled Ideal Family Life. The Family life is also meant for spiritual progress. And we are seeing Kadama Muni, and he's going to enter into family life. Manu is going to come and bring his beautiful daughter Devahuti and leave her there in the ashram of Kadama Muni. So, Kadama will be happy. He has a wife, he wanted a wife. The Lord knew. It was, the plan, it, it was the arrangement of the Supreme Lord because the Lord also knew what was the desire of his devotee. Kardama Muni had some desire. <coughs> Krishna know, knows the desire of his devotees and he makes arrangements for it. 
Of course, ultimately, Kardama Muni renounced again after enjoying family life for some time and having children. Then Kardama Muni was renounced. He left the home and he left his wife in the care of her son, Kapila Muni. So like this, Kardama is a, a great yogi and even great yogis have some desires even though one may be very advanced in yoga practice still material desires are there and these desires have to be also satisfied in relation to service to the Lord so Krishna arranged all of this for the continued advancement of Kardama Muni he brought him the, he, he arranged the wife, and then later on Kardama Muni, he's already satisfied his desires, and he goes on to renounce again, to enter into the forest. So the Lord has a plan for everyone, to help everyone in their progress. Uh, the material world is the creation of the Lord, so that we can satisfy our desires. We can follow our different desires and through the different modes of nature and try to find some pleasure in this world. But ultimately, the message is that there's no eternal pleasure here in this world. If we want eternal pleasure, we have to go to that place where there is eternal pleasure. We have to transcend the material world. We have to go to the spiritual world. So that this material world is also an opportunity for us that we can prepare ourselves to go back to the spiritual world. So the Lord arranges this material world for two purposes. One is that we can try to fulfill our material desires, try to satisfy our senses, and then also, the world is here that we can use this world to purify our existence so that we can go back to God, to the eternal abode. Now, Lord Krishna in the heart of everyone is uh, awarding everyone according to their qualification. He knows exactly what we want. We have to be very careful, therefore, what we desire. What what, is, what our mind is absorbed in. That consciousness will be, de will determine our future life. At the time of death, whatever enters into our mind will be what we have been absorbed in throughout our life. Sometimes people think, oh, I will be like Ajamil. Ajamil, at the point of death, he chanted Narayan. So let me wait till the time of death, then I will chant. But it's not possible. If we have not practiced chanting the name of the Lord throughout the life, at the time of death, we won't be able to chant. How did Ajamil do it? The Acharyas tell us that Ajamil did not just chant at the end of life, but he was regularly chanting because his son was called Narayan. So he was always addressing his son. The youngest son was given the name Narayan. Now, why would a sinful person like Ajamil give his son the name like that? Narayan, usually a sinful person is not going to give a holy name to their son. But Ajamil was inspired somehow, maybe because in his childhood he had been a dutiful Brahman, and he had performed a lot of worship of the Lord. So, although he had become degraded, he still had these things in his uh, consciousness, in his inner, in the depth of his heart, there was still that remembrance of how he used to worship the Lord. Or it may have been that he was inspired through the association of some devotees, that maybe somewhere, he had met some Vaishnavas and the Vaishnavas had told him that your next child, give your child the name Narayan. It will be very, maybe something like that happened. 
We don't know exactly, but somehow Ajamila had given this name to his son. And be, therefore he was constantly calling, Narayan, where are you? Narayan, what are you doing? Narayan, wake up. Narayan, come and eat. So he was constantly calling the Lord's name. And because he was chanting the name, and his chanting was not Nama Parat, because he was not thinking that I'm chanting the name of the Lord. He was just thinking, it's my son's name. And he was not thinking, I'll get benefit from chanting. He was not thinking, it will destroy my sinful activities, it will give me some punya karma. He was not thinking like that at all. He was just simply calling the name of his son. So he got the benefit of chanting at Namabhas. And because he had called it that name so many times, because he was so attached to his son, when the Yamaduts appeared to him at the time of death, then he also thought of his son. And again he called Narayan. Because he was always used to depending on his son. He was an old man. Even in his old age he had a young child. And he was calling that child's name. Come and help me. These people are coming. So, he, because he called Narayan at that time, therefore his life was prolonged and he was able to, again, achieve perfection. But if we have not practiced throughout our life, we will not be able to call the name of the Lord. It is not such an easy thing. We all have to practice. We are engaging in devotional service here at the level of sadhana bhakti. In the nectar of devotion, it is described that devotional service is performed on three levels. Sadhana bhakti, bhava bhakti, and prema bhakti. Sadhana bhakti means devotional service in practice. Bhava bhakti is devotional service in ecstasy, and prema bhakti is devotional service in love of God. All three levels are pure devotional service. They're all Shuddha Bhakti. But within Shuddha Bhakti there are different levels. So Sadhana Bhakti is what we're practicing here in our temple. Bhava Bhakti and Prema Bhakti, they're very exalted qualities where we will become more and more eager and more and more absorbed in our service to Krishna. But basically we want to achieve Sadhana Bhakti the rules and regulations. All of these different rules and regulations are there to help us to remember Krishna easily. I was talking one evening about how we have to be careful where we eat and what kind of food we eat. And some, one devotee confided in me that sometimes during Damodar program we will go out to people's homes and they will prepare food for us, but the home is not vegetarian. And so it's a problem that they've already prepared something, and if you don't take it, they will feel offended. We have to be a little careful about these things, but it's a rule that devotees, which Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told the devotees, be very careful not to take the food. Prabhupada told the devotees also, don't eat grains cooked by people who are meat eaters, non-devotees, because it will pollute the mind. And when the mind is polluted, then it's very difficult to remember Krishna. That is the fact. We have to take the karma from people who prepare uh, non-vegetarian food. And if you eat the grains they cook, the karma comes in these grains. Just like there's a pastime in Chaitanya Lila, uh, Advaita Acharya had one secretary called Kamalakanta Vishvasa. So it happened that Advaita Acharya, you know, he was a he had six children. Somehow at one point he fell in debt, about 300 rupees. And uh, Kamala Kanta Vishvasa wrote a message to the king of Puri. And he wrote a message saying that Advaita Acharya is the personality of Godhead and he's in debt 300 rupees. 
So when Lord Chaitanya saw the message, he was both pleased and, and not pleased. He was pleased that Kamala Kanta Viswasa had recognized that Advaita Acharya was the personality of Godhead. But he was not pleased that he said he's in debt. That is Rasabas. God is not in debt. Right? If he's Bhagwan, how can Bhagwan be in debt? <clears throat> so Lord Chaitanya said, this is offense to say that Advaita Acharya is in debt. And he, he didn't want to see Kamala Kanta Vishwasa again. He said, don't bring that person to see me again. Cannot come in my association. So when Advaita Acharya heard about this, he said, oh, why you give him special treatment? He said, when I did a fetch, you came and beat me. Advaita Acharya, he had also done a fetch, right? Because uh, Lord Chaitanya was always respecting him. Because he is so much senior, he was senior in age, and he was like the father of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But Advaita Acharya knew that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is God. He's Lord Krishna himself. And he wanted to respect Lord Chaitanya. He didn't like Lord Chaitanya respecting him. Therefore, Advaita Acharya began to, he said, I will, I will make Lord Chaitanya so angry that he will not respect me. So Advaita Acharya began to read from one book called Yoga Vashishta. And he began to preach that the goal of life is impersonal liberation. Everyone should aspire to get Sayuja Mukti and enter into the Brahman. Ultimately, there's only the Brahman. There's only oneness. And he was preaching like this. And Lord Chaitanya got the news. And when Lord Chaitanya got the news, he was so angry. He rushed all the way over from Mayapur, all the way to Shantipur. And he got to Shantipur and he got Advaita Acharya and he held him and he threw him on the ground and he beat him. And Advaita Acharya was thinking, this is, what, this is what I want. This is excellent. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya, now he's beating me. He loves me so much. He's beating me. Yeah. He said, that now my life is good. And the wife, of course, she, Advaita Acharya's wife, she was, no, stop, you'll kill him. Please, don't beat my husband. So anyway, Advaita Acharya was very happy that Lord Chaitanya was so angry with him. But when Lord Chaitanya said he didn't want to see Kamala Kanta Viswasa again, Advaita Acharya said, well, why you give him so much more mercy than you give me? When I did wrong, you beat me. But you never stopped me from coming to see you. You're stopping him from coming to see you. You're giving him a bigger punishment than you gave me. Why you didn't give me a bigger punishment? Why you give him a bigger punishment? This Lord Chaitanya was upset, uh, Lord, uh, rather Advaita Acharya was upset that you're punishing my secretary more than you punish me. You should give me more punishment, not him. So when Lord Chaitanya heard this, then okay, he said, all right, all right, bring him. Bring this Kamala Kanta Vishwasa. And then they brought the man. And then Kamala Kanta Vishwasa was told by Lord Chaitanya, that it's very good you understand the identity of Advaita Acharya, that he is the personality of Godhead. But why do you say he's in debt? 300 rupees. Of course, we're, we're paying 300 rupees today, it's nothing, but in Lord Chaitanya's time, 300 rupees was a very big sum. <coughs> so so why, is he, why are you saying he's in debt? Like, this is offense, this is rasabhas. God is never in debt. You know, sometimes they have this thing that Daridra Narayan, that this is nonsense. God is not a poor man. God is, you know, God is a swine, he's a Bhagavan, he's a personality of God. He has all opulences. He's not a poor man. He, he's the richest man. So, uh, Lord Chaitanya then instructed Kamala Kanta Vishwasa that you must be very careful.